not just a job. It's there's something that you you have to reach out to people, and they reach out to you. So I I had, I had a lot of experiences at the hospice, whereby essentially people would be appear as if they were out, you know, because the morphine is morphine, or they might have M, M, uh, ALS or Alzheimer's, and yet when I would give them a a, a brush or when I would be doing work, they would literally come come forth. I had uh, one woman who had Alzheimer's. She did the most amazing watercolors. And she couldn't speak any longer. She couldn't walk. She couldn't whatever. But I would put uh, a brush in her hand. And she would do these incredible watercolors. Another person couldn't see any longer. Yet, essentially, he would talk about um, his life essentially, his life and all these things, and essentially I, I would start doing storybooks of his life. And what was interesting, he, he passed on and I called his family and said, you know, I have some things that you might want to see. They arrived immediately and they were just touched that this, his life was depicted on these, in these images. And the hospice was also, was amazing for me and uh, each each of the logs that I had, I had to do the logs right away because I was afraid I'd miss some detail that was very pertinent. And also the staff. The staff, you know, they're dealing constantly with a very somber state. Um, I'd come in and essentially I'd bring in, you know, I'd start doing birds or I'd start doing flowers or, or specific things and they would have some sense of life, some sense of joy. One of the key things in architecture, they talk about that environment cues behavior. So essentially, if you set up a sanitized environment with you know, just a preparation, especially in a hospice, you're preparing for the afterlife and giving up on all the joys. Or I, I don't think that's appropriate. I think they're, what I found is most of my patients were so actively clinging to the joys of life. I mean, there was one patient who essentially had just collapsed um, the day before he died, and I, he knew I was there, and he wanted so desperately to see me that he asked, uh, the, the director said, Desi, your session is over with him. You can't work with him anymore. And he said, no, I want you to bring me back out there. I want to be with her. And he couldn't draw that day. He said to me, draw me today. And I drew him, and he could not stand up very much, and he couldn't stand much longer. And he went back, and the next day he, he perished. My, my paradigm was I'd start out first with the staff, somehow bring something to the picture with the staff. They'd see me, I'd start saying hello to them, kissing them, making sure that you know we're, we're animated, and then the staff would integrate with the patients. And then I bring, I, you know, it was a lot of the things that I brought in was essentially, like Robin said, luring them. It, I would have to think about how do I lure mm -hmm. people into a sense of getting out of their state uh, of mind. I mean, I had one woman, very severe cervical cancer, and she was just in a very, very dark place. And I, I don't, you know, I, I could not even imagine because it, she was so young and she couldn't, she literally would not sleep the night before infusion and so it was something really, she, she was just incredibly agitated and so I would bring things to lure her to start with talking and then begin to move her into the art. I think it's I think it's a mistake to come in and, uh, for me, I've, I can't say, maybe other artists had a successful venture with it. I think it's a mistake to come in and say, here it is, we're going to do this, and blah, blah, blah. That's not going to happen, at least not in that infusion. It didn't happen. It you had to somehow anymore. engage them as a person and see what it is they can do with you or be with you. Prior to this, I did a lot of amazing projects, you know, large scale buildings, courthouses, and whatever else, but it wasn't as profound to me 
as working with these patients. That there's a, a specific value that is just such a deep thing because they needed it so much. That's really the, the key thing. They, one person needing this human interaction at the most difficult time in their lives. So I had it for six months, but I didn't lose my hair. And then I had 34 radiations. And then I found acting. I would wanted to be an actress in high school and college, but I was always embarrassed about the pressure of wanting attention. You can hear it in those words. But I got permission from cancer. So I joined a, a local theater group. And I was in mornings at 7, and somebody said, well, why don't you? Why don't you sing the grandmother and Pippin? I said, well, I, so I got lessons in singing, and I was the grandmother and Pippin. <laughs> then I was in Whose Life Is It Anyway? And then I was Madame Armfeld in A Little Night Music. Acting is, is an amazing, an amazing experience. Because people pay attention to how well you move them within the script. So it isn't like you're just standing there saying, OK, I, you all recognize I'm a big deal just standing here? I'm not. And the, and the Creative Center antedated this time with people doing um, acting groups. In fact, I, I learned how to write songs. Somebody was doing a songwriting group. So I wrote Jewish female geriatric rap. It's amazing that what cancer did was set up sequential gifts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Anyway. Take it away, Tim. Okay. I was born a Jew. I was born a girl. So what could I do but live in the world? Had an older brother. Could have had another. Girls were despised. I tell you, no lies. You're smarter than your brother. Hardly noticed by your mother. You're a second-class creature with a dismal future. No help from parents. They're trapped in the new world. Never mind you're bright. You can never be right. So you learn to read, and in time you bleed. Don't let the boys get close. They'll give you a dose and possibly maybe give you a baby. So shut your body down and don't fool around. Well, what do you do with your feelings? They send you, really. Watch out for the goy. You'll never be a boy. Doesn't help to be sweet. Doesn't help to be tough. The life of the secretary's hardly enough. Oh, mama. You ran from Russia alive in order to survive. You left with family way before you had me. There was Ethel on the boat. You met her brother. He fell for you hard. There was no other. So you had to marry. You had no choice. Though there was a doctor with a warm, sweet voice, but he wasn't a Jew. So what could you do? You had to say no. I've lived a life insulted and never consulted. I married a goy. Never became a boy. Oh, Mama, I'm lost in the new world.